Okay, today is December 19th, 2015. Okay, so we'll start with the three, three times the homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Okay, good morning, everybody. Okay, so today. We will be taking the suttas that I actually had intended for last week. Let's see, this is sutta number 144. Okay, and this is a bit of a controversial sutta, as we'll see. So this is called the Chanovada Sutta, the sutta of, here it's translated advice to Chana, but as I've explained, Uvada has a stronger meaning than advice, it's something like an exhortation. Okay, so the sutta, it's set at a time when the Buddha is living in the bamboo grove, but the main event of the sutta doesn't involve the Buddha, but a group of monks with the Venerable Sariputta, the Venerable Mahachunda, both of those are well-known, highly revered, great disciples of the Buddha. And then there is another monk named Channa, And the three of them are living on the mountain called Vulture's Peak. Okay, and then the sutta tells us that on this occasion, the Venerable Channa was afflicted, suffering, and gravely ill. This is a stock expression used everywhere in the suttas to describe somebody who is seriously ill. Okay, so then the text tells us that in the evening, the Venerable Sariputta emerged from meditation and he went to the Venerable Mahachanda and he said, let us go to the Venerable Channa and ask about his illness. And so the two of them go off to meet the Venerable Channa. Okay, so after they, when they meet, then Sariputta asks the Venerable Channa, he says, again, this is the stock expression, when others are meeting a sick person, they say, I hope you are getting well, I hope you are comfortable, I hope your pains are subsiding and not increasing, and their subsiding, not their increase, is apparent. Okay, but here Channa replies in exactly the same words, or almost the same words that we came across in the previous sutta, the discourse to Anatta Pindika, when Anatta Pindika was very ill. Okay, so Channa says that, friend Sariputta, I'm not getting well, I'm not feeling comfortable, my pains are increasing, not subsiding. Then he goes on to describe his condition. To get the actual text, when us to turn back to Sutta 43, section number 4, that it's just as if a strong man were splitting my head open with a sharp sword, just as if a strong man were pulling a tough leather, leather strap around my head, just as if a skilled butcher 
were carving up an ox's belly with a sharp butcher's knife. <laughs> but just as if a two strong men were to grab hold of a weaker man by both arms and roast him over a pot of hot coals, a pit of hot coals, so I am not getting well, I am not comfortable, my pains are increasing, not subsiding. But then he adds something else that Anatta Pindika didn't say. He says, I shall use the knife, friend Sariputta. I have no desire to live. And when he says, I will use the knife, this doesn't mean that he's going to use the knife to cut up an apple or a peach, but it, <laughs> it means that he's going to use the knife on himself. In other words, I'm going to take my own life. Okay, so when he says this, then Sariputta, Venerable Sariputta, protests, and he says, please, Venerable Chanda, don't think of using the knife. Please continue to live on. We want you to live on. If you lack suitable food, I will ensure that you get suitable food. Um, if you lack suitable medicines, I'll arrange to get suitable medicines for you. If you lack an attendant, somebody to keep constant, to constantly take care of you, I'll arrange to get, and it, he says, if you lack a proper attendant, I will attend on you. I myself will attend on you. And then again, he says, please don't think of using the knife. We want you to live. Okay, but then Chana remains, at least apparently he remains firm in his decision. So he answers Sariputta's petition by saying that it's not that I lack suitable food, I have suitable food, it's not that I lack medicine, I've taken so many medicines and none of them are working, it's not that I lack a proper attendant. Okay, then he says, and I'm not so happy with this translation, he says, well, let me translate the way I would do it now. I think this comes, this with love comes from Venerable Yanamoli. <laughs> but I looked at the actual Pali text, and it uses the expression manapena, which means agreeable or in an agreeable way. So he says, rather, friend Sariputta, the teacher, that's the Buddha, has long been worshipped or venerated by me in an agreeable way, not in a disagreeable way. It is proper for a disciple to venerate or to serve the teacher in an agreeable way, not in a disagreeable way. And then he adds the statement, he says, Friend Sariputta, remember that the Bhikkhu Chana will use the knife blamelessly. It's a note here. Let's just read the note. <clears throat> okay, so the note says that by making this statement, he is implicitly claiming arahatship. And that will become clear later in paragraph 13. Okay, now what's interesting is that, okay, this is the Pali version of the sutta. But I checked my friend Venerable Analeo's notes, comparative notes on comparing the Chinese version with the, um, with the Pali version. In the Chinese version, Chanda doesn't make that statement, but rather he says that he can no longer endure the pain and affliction of his illness, that the pain and affliction of, Ill of his illness are just overpowering. Okay, but let us just take the Pali version as the one that we'll be discussing. 
So when he says that he'll use the knife blamelessly in the light of what the Buddha is going to say later, this means or implies that he's claiming, it implies that he's attained arahatship. And so he's using the knife for taking his own life as an arahat. <clears throat> okay, now Sariputta says, I'm going to ask you certain questions. So it seems that Sariputta here wants to test Chana to see whether he has actually attained arahatship. And there's something a little puzzling in the question that I'll bring up. So he says, I will ask the Venerable Chana certain questions if you wouldn't find it a burden to reply. Okay, so then Chana says, you may ask, and then when I've heard your questions, then I'll see whether I can answer them. Okay, so then Sariputta says, friend Chana, do you regard the I, I consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through I consciousness thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. And the same question is repeated for each of the other sense spaces. Do you regard the ear, nose, tongue, body, the mind, mind consciousness, and things cognizable by the mind through mind consciousness thus? This is mine, this I am, this is myself. Okay, then Chana replies, I regard the I, I consciousness and things cognizable through I consciousness, that is visible forms, thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. I regard the ear, nose, tongue, body, mind, mind consciousness and dhammas, that is mental phenomena, cognizable through mind consciousness, thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Okay, from Chana's and from the questions and Chana's answers to these questions, what if Chana's questions are really truthful and correct, what can we infer about Chana? Speak up, please. Excuse me? Exactly. Or that he's at least a stream enterer. But you might be inclined, you know, to see this, you might be inclined to draw the inference that he's an arhat. But it's not necessarily the case, because this is what is seen by any of the noble disciples, starting from the level of stream enterer. So we have, there's a number of suttas, several suttas that occur in the Sangyuta Nikaya. I think that's in chapter 22. It's somewhere around, I'm sure that I had made some notes, now I can't find them. <laughs> exactly where those suttas are. I think it's about Sutta, somewhere in the 100s in, in chapter 22, where the question is raised, what is the defining mark of a stream enterer? And it's one who is seen, in this case, it's the five aggregates as being not I, not my, not I, not myself. And then the next Sutta says, what is the defining mark of the Arahat? It's one who having seen the five aggregates as being not mine, not I, not myself. His mind is liberated from the asavas through non-clinging. And so this is why I find this a bit strange that if they were testing to see definitely what, whether he was an arahat, then the question should have been phrased in a way that, you know, focused in on one of the defining characteristics of an arhat. 
But in any case, at this point, the questions are testing whether he is at any level from stream enter up. So this would be especially, this would be like the defining characteristic of what is called the seka. The seka is the one in higher training and generally comprises those at the first three stages of realization. Stream enter of once returning, non-returning. Okay, so then Sariputta continues with the question and he says, what have you seen and what have you directly known? This is Abhinya, Abhij, Abhinyaya, in the eye, eye consciousness and in things cognizable through eye consciousness. And then continuing, what have you known in the ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and so forth, that you regard them thus, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. So now he's asking about the content of that realization, by reason of which he's able to affirm the non-self nature of the six sense bases, their objects, and their corresponding types of consciousness. And then Sarip, uh, the Venerable Chana replies, Friend Sariputta, it, it is through seeing and directly knowing cessation in the I, I consciousness, etc., that I regard them thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. And then the same is repeated for the other five sense bases. And so the essential point here is that he's saying that it is knowing cessation. And sort of this is, you could say, situating his explanation or his claim within the framework of the Four Noble Truths. Because what enable, what is the content of a stream enterer's realization of the Four Noble Truths is the realization of the Third Noble Truth, the direct seeing of the cessation of Dukkha, which is actually the cessation of all conditioned phenomena. And so when it said that the stream enterer is one who has understood as they really are the Four Noble Truths, what makes that understanding complete, it's not the understanding of dukkha, its origin or the path, but it's the direct experience or realization of nibbana, which is the cessation of dukkha. And so it's with the realization, the direct seeing of nibbana, that the fetter of sakaya ditti, the view of self is eradicated, cut off. And when that fetter of the view of self is eradicated, then one sees and understands that the five aggregates or the six sense bases and their objects are all not mine, not I, not myself. Okay, so, so far, you know, from what we can deduce, you know, setting these statements within the broader framework of the teaching, that even though Chana said, I'm going to use the knife blamelessly, implying that he's an arhat, but if his claim is genuine, or his answers to Sariputta's questions are genuine and correct and accurate and truthful, then at most we can infer that he is a seka. He might be an arhat, but the answers themselves do not set forth a claim to arhatship.
Okay, so when this was said, then the Venerable Mahachunda, the other monk who is with Sariputta, then makes a statement to the Venerable uh, Chana. He says, Therefore, friend Chana, this instruction of the Blessed Ones is to be constantly given attention. And according to the commentary, the Venerable Mahachunda said this because he was convinced that Chunda was still a, we call a Putujana, that is a worldling, an unenlightened person. In any case, it seems that Mahachunda had the idea, this is my understanding, that Mahachunda had the idea that the Venerable Chana was definitely going to go ahead and to use the knife to take his life. And so he gave him this advice, the way I would understand it, as something to be borne in mind as he goes into the death process, so that he's able to, by keeping the mind focused upon this, then he wouldn't give rise to fear and agitation when entering upon the death process, and could even attain our hardship in the course of the death process. So, it seems, I'm not sure that I would agree that Mahachanda necessarily thought that Channa was a worldling, but he might have thought from the answers that he still, that he might be a noble one, but not yet an arhat. So he's giving this him this advice with the understanding that perhaps if Chana bears this advice, this statement in mind, while he's entered the death process, then he could achieve liberation before death takes place. So the statement is that, I'll just reverse the wording a little bit to bring out the sense better. For one who is dependent, there is wavering, chalita, movement, kind of vacillation, even agitation. And by dependent is usually meant, in this case, nisitasa. The word nisita implies either relying upon, the being dependent upon craving, or upon views. But if Chana was really a stream enterer or higher, then they wouldn't be relying upon or depending upon views because he's overcome wrong views, but there will still be some tendency towards craving. Okay, so for one who is dependent, in the sense of who still has some trace of craving left, there is this agitation. In one who is independent, who is freed from that dependency on craving, there is no wavering, no fluctuation, no agitation. Okay, when there is no agitation, then there is tranquility, pasadi, calmness. When there is no tranquility, I'm sorry, when there is tranquility, again, I don't like this, the rendering here, there is no, here the, the rendering is, there is no bias, but the Pali word is actually nati, which means, literally, it's bending. The word nati is actually related to the word namo. When we do homage to the Buddha, we say namo tassa bhagavato. So namo is sort of bending in as an act of homage. But nati here, in this passage, it's not homage, but it's 
bending or inclination. And I think the idea here is a bending in the sense of inclining towards a new existence, towards going on to rebirth, or a bending towards a particular destiny of rebirth. Okay, so when there is tranquility, and this would be probably the perfect tranquility of arhatship, then there is no bending or inclination. When there is no bending, there is no coming and going. This is coming into a new existence by way of birth or conception and going that's departing from that existence by way of death. In other words, there's no more birth and death. And when there is no coming and going, there is no passing away and reappearing or rearising. This is actually just saying almost the same thing, just inverting the two stages. Okay, when there is no passing away and reappearing or rearising, there is no here, that is no more coming into this world, nor anything beyond that is passing by way of rebirth into some other realm of existence, some other world, nor anything in between. And interestingly, <laughs> this little phrase here, and it nor in between, seems to me to be suggesting that there is some state of passage between one existence and another existence. So this can be taken as the basis for an idea that raised storms of controversy among the early Buddhist schools. <laughs> to, to me, it seems like something that generates more heat than light. The question whether there is an intermediate stage between existences. You know, the orthodox position of the Theravadan commentaries, based on a few rather obscure passages in the Abhidhamma, is no intermediate stage. Death is followed instantaneously by a new birth. The, I think it was the Sarvastivada school and a few other schools aligned with the Sarvastivadans, based on passages like this, said that there, that this is sort of proof or evidence that there is an intermediate stage. My own conviction, <laughs> heretical conviction, based on some other passages, is that there is an intermediate stage. And not, not based only on textual passages, but also accounts that I've read of people who have recollections of their previous life and of what took place at death before their birth into that existence. Okay, so here Maha Chunda is saying, when there is no passing away and re-arising, then there is no here, it's coming back into this world, nor beyond, that is passing by way of rebirth into some other world, nor anything in between. This is the end of Dukkha. Eso va Dukkha Santo. Antam, I think it's. So this is the end of Dukkha. In other words, this is the attainment of final Nibbana. Okay, so now the text continues that when the Venerable Sariputta and the Venerable Mahachunda had exhorted the Venerable Chana thus, then they rose from their seats and went away. It seems a little strange to me <laughs> that 
you know, I would think in a situation where there are three monks living together and one of them says, I'm going to use the knife, I'm going to take my life, that one of them would be set up as a constant guard, you know, to constantly being present to console the monk, to encourage him when he's feeling dejected. And if there are any indications that he's going to use the knife to try to stop him. But anyway, the text tells us that that um, Sariputta and the Venerable Mahachunda, after exhorting the monk Chana, they got up from their seats and went away. And then soon after they had left, the text says, the Venerable Chana used the knife. Okay. <laughs> now the commentary gives us some interesting account. This is in the note on the note 1311. The commentary says, he cut his throat, this is the jugular vein, and just at that moment, the fear of death descended on him, and then the sign of future rebirth appeared. This is called the Gati Nimitta. This is an Abhidhamic term, which means that when the death process is occurring, it will occur to the mind within the death process. It can be either the sign of some karma that one has performed, or else the sign of a future destiny, or else the image of some object associated with the karma that one has performed that's going to determine the next rebirth. In this case, it's said to be the gati nimitta, the sign of the future rebirth. Okay, so then recognizing that he was still an ordinary person, let's say putujana, a worldling, a common person, a Chana became aroused, and then he developed insight. And then comprehending the sankharas, the conditioned phenomena, he attained arhatship just before he expired. So this is from the commentary. And, you know, sometimes I have to raise the question, how does the commentator know that? Now, there's nothing like that is said in the sutta itself, and it seems important enough that if this were the case, it would be said in the sutta. And one might say, okay, it comes down through oral tradition, but then I raise the question, where did that oral tradition originate? If it originated, well, Sariputta and Mahachanda weren't present when, present when he committed suicide, and I mean, one sit might say, okay, the Buddha used his super knowledge to see what was going on in China's mind. In that the case, then the Buddha should have explained what happened in the sutta. So it seems to me that, again, my opinion, that the commentaries, and this is probably going back to the old commentaries, were perplexed at the idea of an arhat taking his life, and so they had to find some way to explain that. But I think if we just stick to the text of the sutta, as we'll see, that it seems to be confirming that Chana, at least at the time that he used the knife, was an arhat. Okay, so soon after they had gone, the Venerable Chana used the knife. Okay, then Sariputta goes to the Buddha. They've been living on Mount Vulture's Peak, which is a tall mountain. They're all outside of Rajagaha, and the Buddha is staying in the bamboo grove, bamboo grove, which is on the plain. So Sariputta has to come down from Vulture's Peak, and he goes to the Buddha, and then he says to the Blessed One, Bhante, the Venerable Chana, has used the knife 
What is his destination? What is his future course? So from this question, obviously, <laughs> Sariputta didn't use his super knowledge to see what was going on in Chanda's mind during his death process, because Sariputta still thinks that Chanda died as a non-arahat. So he's asking, what was his realm of rebirth? And now, this is the interesting thing. The Buddha doesn't reply with the words of the commentary. <laughs> he doesn't say, well, when Chana used the knife, he was still a worldling, but in the course of the death process, he aroused fear because of the sign of rebirth, contemplated the formations as impermanent, and reached arhatship before his death. But the Buddha just confirms the original statement of the monk Chana. He says, didn't the monk Chana declare to you his blamelessness? Yeah, it's inter- I have a, a. I express my own opinion in in the note itself. I say that it should be imposed that the commentarial interpretation is imposed on the text from the outside, as it were. But if one sticks to the actual wording of the text, it seems that Chana was already an arhat when he made his declaration, and the dramatic punch is the failure of his two brother monks to recognize this. Okay, so from the Buddha's statement, it seems pretty clear, at least to me, that at the time Chana used the knife, took his own life, he was already an arhat. Okay, when the Buddha says this, and Sariputta immediately accepts it, and then he says that there is a Vajian village called Pubajira. The name of the village actually is a little bit different in different editions, and there's a version, the parallel version of the Sutta in the Samyutta Nikaya, in the section on the six sense bases in which the name of the village is still different, doesn't mean mean anything. There, the Venerable Chana had friendly families, intimate families, approachable families, and I, I must have added in brackets, or maybe Nyanamoli did, as his supporters. Okay, now there's a wordplay here, which it seems a little strange to me that there should be a wordplay in a situation like this. But there's a wordplay that comes out in Pali based upon what's called a homonym, a word in Pali that's the same, it's the same word in Pali. Well, let's say two words with different meanings which come to be the same word in Pali. If we represent them in Sanskrit, they come out to be two different words. So the word in Pali is
Yeah, there's one word, upavadya. This is in Sanskrit, upavadya, which would mean blamable, blameworthy. And it's based on the verbal root vad, which means to speak. So this is when one speaks critically about somebody, it's upavadati. One criticizes or blames somebody. And then the participle form of to be blamed or blameworthy is upavadya. But there's another word in Sanskrit, upavadya, based upon the verbal root vraj, which means to go to. And so upavrajati would mean to approach. And upavrajya would mean to be approached. So it seems that the appropriate sense would be that these are friendly fam families, intimate families, families to be approached, to be approached and to be informed. But the Pali word comes out upavajja, which sort of connects to the word upavajja in the earlier description of chana as being anupavajja, blameless in the use of the knife. Okay, so that, this merging of the two meanings explains the Buddha's reply. The Buddha says, Indeed, Sariputta, the monk Chana had friendly families, intimate families, approachable families, and it seems that by using the word upavajja, upavajani kulani, in relation to those families, Sariputta is, or at least the text is suggesting that there might have been some inappropriate relations between Chana and these families, that Chana was getting too intimate with these families. And so, this explains what the Buddha says next. He says, but I do not say to this extent he was blameworthy. Like that is the, the wordplay between approachable as a description of the families, upavajja, upavajani kulani, and chana as being anupavajja, not blameworthy, not blameable. Okay, then the Buddha makes this statement to Sariputta. He says, when one lays down this body and takes up a new body, then I say one is blameworthy. And this is sort of a generalization applying not only in the case of one who takes his own life, but anybody who, in laying aside this body with death, moves on as a result of ignorance, craving, and clinging, moves on to a new existence and takes up a new body, comes into a new existence. To that extent, one is blameworthy because one hasn't eliminated the defilements that are responsible for generating a new existence. And then the Buddha continues, this did not happen in the case of the bhikkhu chana. The bhikkhu chana used the knife blamelessly. <clears throat> okay, then I have the note to this. With, and I, and the note says, this statement seems to imply that Chana was an arhat at the time he committed suicide, even though the commentary explains otherwise. Okay, so this is what the Blessed One, what the Buddha said, then the Venerable Sariputta was satisfied and he delighted in the Buddha's words.
Okay, and that takes us to the Channa Sutta. Any questions or comments? Yes, please. Yeah. Oh, that there's this um, mobile microphone. Please, please use that. My comment on, yeah. on the blameless part. Yeah. I just feel that if you're not observing, yeah. the attainment. If you're not observing the precepts purely, you're not going to reach. Of, of course, observing the precepts purely is a precondition, but more than just observing the precepts is necessary to reach our hardship. Yeah, so I'm just thinking the fact that he was thinking about it. Oh, that that was important? Yeah, that was a breach of the precept. That was a breach of the precept because you can't, you can't kill anyone for any crime that's committed against yourself. Yeah. So that's why he's This is where I have a different opinion. <laughs> Of course, in the abstract, the precept says, Panati Pata Vera Manisi Kapata. So, one undertakes the training rule to abstain from the destruction of life. Okay. And then for a monk, there's a graver precept, which is one is not to take a human life either directly or by encouraging another to take his own life or by providing the instruments for somebody to take his own life. Okay, but I understand that this applies to other beings. It doesn't apply to oneself. And now in the case of a human being, a, per a person, who is inclined to suicide because of emotional distress, agitation, and so forth, Definitely in that case, you know, we have to say one should not commit suicide. Um, one has to learn to overcome this stress and this mental agitation and emotional dejection and so on. But I take the precept to abstain from the destruction of life to be based on the principle that all beings seek, want to live, not to die, want to be happy, not to suffer. Now, in the case of an, somebody who's reached our hardship and is afflicted with an extremely painful disease, apparently Chandra has taken a variety of medicines, Probably they took him to see an acupuncturist. The acupuncture didn't work. They took him to see, he wouldn't have tried Western medicine, but they would have taken to him to given him the Ayurvedic Indian medicine, maybe burned, they call this moksha on him, given him every type of treatment, reiki treatment, everything. Nothing worked. He had this it must have been an extremely afflictive illness, constant, uninterrupted, from his description, like a man, a butcher cutting the belly of an ox, like his strong men roasting him over a pit. You know, constant, uninterrupted pain. And the alternative is either to endure that or to sever the life faculty and to enter into the ineffable, everlasting, <laughs> imperturbable, perfect bliss of the Nibbana element with no residue remaining. <laughs> and so for him, the choice, the, the choice was a clear one. That's my understanding. And please don't take this in any way if you're feeling anybody here gets dejected, depressed, or has some mental conflict, please don't take me to be suggesting suicide. I'm just saying that in the case of an arhat, 
who has this constant afflictive illness, as the Buddha says, the use of the knife is blameless. Public. Could we apply this to the uh, inhalations in Tibet and China? We don't know, and most of them probably aren't arhats, but this thinking, because that's always bothered me in terms of the precept. Yeah, this is quite a different case. It, let's take the case of Vietnam, mm -hmm. the monks in Vietnam. The, this was not a case first where they were in any way claiming to be arhat chips or thought themselves to be arhat, and not a case where they were suffering from an extremely oppressive illness, but they were suffering from an extremely oppressive condition that, well, also, this also applies to Tibet, but particularly in Vietnam, I know in 1963, was my first Buddhist teacher was a Vietnamese monk who was involved on the inside of those events, that the government of Vietnam at that time, it was the government of Mo, Di, Mo Ding Dien, he was a staunch Roman Catholic who wanted to impose Catholicism on the whole country. And so he prohibited the Buddhists from observing their traditional, especially the traditional holidays. He cut off, the Buddhists had a radio station where they presented, you know, Buddhist teachings. He prohibited that. Um, he prohibited, I think, Dhamma lectures by the monks in the temples. And so the, the Buddhists had no way to commun and he cut off all communication between the Buddhists and the outside world. So they had no way to convey their message to the outside world. So this was the way the first monk who did this, I mean, he was a meditating monk, not, a polit not, that, not one who was really politically involved, but he thought that the only way we could convey this message to the outside world of what way Buddhism is being persecuted here is by some dramatic event. And so he decided then to take his own life. In fact, I mean, it wasn't like, you know, using a knife to, to cut his throat, but, you know, the image of sitting in the fire. And if you've seen that image, you see he remains sitting in meditative samadhi right while the flame is engulfing him. In Tibet, I don't... I mean, I know they've taken their, that monks have taken their life. I don't know whether they were actually sitting immobile within the flames. Yes? Okay, I had a question about... Um, yeah, it's good if you take the mobile microphone so it gets into the, into the recording. I had a question about these two uh, Bali roots that you mentioned. You said yes. Sanskrit roots. Yeah. So with the second one, I was under the impression that when we have a, a double consonant in the Sanskrit root, yeah. that that double consonant would still be preserved um, when we add the poly prefix. So, like, I might be totally wrong here, which is why I'm asking. Yeah. Um, what I would expect then is that the VR would become a VV, which then goes to VB, but we would still see that double consonant. So instead of upavanja, we would see yeah. upavanja. So, I think uh, maybe that would be expected, but it seems that the pun came through here with, within the way the text was preserved. Um, so do we see Upavajra used in that sense of approachable elsewhere in the suttas? Um, I'd have to look into the... Okay. To, to do a search for that. Okay. Yes. Um... Wait, I'm, I'm just trying. To, I'm just coming to my mind. It's just coming to mind. To probably for his question. It's a word that means avoid. Yeah, I'll have to check that. I'm pretty sure that there is an example of that where the, you just get the V without the doubling of the consonant. Yes, my question is, um, wouldn't the overwhelming desire to end the pain be yeah. a craving? You know, this is, that's a question that I've pondered on. And I would, the conclusion I would come in the case of an arhat, that it wouldn't be a form of craving. That there is just this overwhelming pain, and one considers that 
it's not necessary to endure it, and that there is that alternative. Again, please don't take this in any way as an encouragement <laughs> to suicide. It's just that there, the sutta seems to be recognizing this, that possibility. And somebody else have? Yep. Your name again is keeps on. Mano. Mano, 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 Mano. Uh, there's a commentary. I'm just making reference to. 1349, where it says that uh, uh, Archuna gave his, him his, this instruction thinking he must still be an ordinary person since he could not endure the deadly pains and wanted to commit suicide. So would you disagree with that based on what you said previously? <laughs> yeah. I think I would, dis I would disagree Let's say, I'm not in a position to disagree, but I would raise a question about the commentarial explanation rather than the commentarial explanation of what Mahachunda was thinking. Because I would think that Mahachunda could have understood the implications of Chana's answers to Sariputta's questions correctly, that Mahachunda could have thought Chana indeed has answered accurately, he must be either a stream enter or once return a non-returner, but not yet an arhat, so I'm going to give him this exhortation as a kind of, to, to support him as he goes into the death process. You know, so it's not that, in other words, where the commentary is saying that Mahachunda thought that Chana was a worldly, a worldling, an ordinary person. I think it's possible that Mahachanda thought that Chana was a seka, one in the training, but not yet an arhat. Further questions? Okay, I said that we would try to, uh, last week, I said we would try to cover two discourses in today's class. So now we'll go on to the next sutta. This is short and fairly simple. Well, actually, though it's not so short, but there's a repetitive pattern. Okay, so this sutta concerns a different monk by the name of Puna. And according to the commentary background explanation, Pune had been a merchant from the west of India, from the region called Suna Paranta, which corresponds roughly to the area where today Mumbai or Bombay is located. And then he, he was a merchant, a traveling merchant. And so when he came to Savati, he heard the Buddha preach, and by hearing the Buddha's discourses, he decided to become a monk. Okay, so now Buddha comes to the Buddha and requests the Buddha to give him what's called brief advice or brief instruction in order that he might go off into seclusion and meditate on it. Okay, so then the Buddha gives him the instruction that there are forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. If a bhikkhu delights in them, welcomes them, and remains holding to them, then delight arises in him. Then with the arising of delight, there is the arising of dukkha, I say. So this, in a way, it's a very 
you say, a very concise statement of the relationship between the second and the first noble truths. Here by the word delight does not meant the ordinary pleasure that we think of. Perhaps in a sense it does cover the pleasure that we think of. But Nandi is expressed or understood as the delight that is associated with craving. And so in the Second Noble Truth, we have the, what is the Second Noble Truth? It's that Tanha, which is Nandi Raga Sahagata, that is, it's craving that is connected with, associated with Nandi, delight, and Raga lust or passion. So the way I would understand it, when one has craving for what one doesn't possess, that is raga, and when one sort of delights in the things that one does possess, that is nandi. And so underlying that delight, there is this clinging or holding to the objects of pleasure. Okay, so then the Buddha repeats this for each of the six other five sense bases and then draws, again he draws the conclusion with the arising <coughs> of this delight there is the arising of dukkha. So this is or covers the second and first noble truths Then in the next passage, the Buddha covers, you could say, the third and fourth noble truths. So he says there are forms cognizable by the eye and so forth. If a bhikkhu does not delight in them, welcome them and remain holding to them, delight ceases in him. With the cessation of delight, there is the cessation of dukkha, I say. So here we could say that not delighting, not welcoming, not holding is in a sense a summation of the path. And then the seizing of delight, well, let's say the seizing of dukkha that occurs with the seizing of, well, let's say, okay, when the path is brought to, to its consummation, then that delight, that delight that's accompanying the craving, that seizes, so that's the consummation of the path, and then with the cessation of delight, there is the cessation of dukkha or suffering. That is the third noble truth. Okay, then the Buddha, somehow he must have known of Puna's intention because he asks, after I've given you this brief exhortation, where will you dwell? And usually the Buddha doesn't ask this, usually the monk just gets the advice or the instruction from the Buddha and then he goes off someplace in seclusion. But now, in this case, Buddha replies that now that you've given me this brief exhortation, I am going to dwell in the Sunna Paranta country. And if we follow the commentary, that would have been his own native land. So then the Buddha says that the people of Sunaparanta are fierce and rough. If they abuse you and threaten you, what will you think then? And then uh, Puna says, if If the people of Sunaparanta abuse and threaten me, then I shall think that these people are excellent, truly excellent, and that they do not give me a blow with the fist. 
Okay, then the questions continue in the series. Okay, if they give you a blow with the fist, what will you think? Then I'll think that they're truly excellent because they do not give me a blow with a club. Back in ancient India, that would have been maybe the worst type of weapon that people had. Or a clod, or a, the next one is a stick. Well, actually, it gets worse as we go on, and that they do not give me a blow with a knife. Okay, if they give you a blow with a knife, what will you think? That they're truly excellent, that they have not taken my life with a sharp knife, then I will think thus, blessed one. Okay, then the Buddha says, if the people of Sunaparanta take your life with a sharp knife, what will you think then? Okay, then Puna says, if they take my life with a sharp knife, then I will think that there have been disciples of the blessed one who being repelled, humiliated, and disgusted by the body and by life, have sought an assailant, somebody to take their life. But I have obtained this assailant without even seeking one. I shall think thus. Okay, then the Buddha commends him and says, Good, good, Puna possessing such self-control and peacefulness or gentleness, you will be able to dwell in the Sunaparanta country. Now you may go at your convenience. And when Puna makes that statement about the disciples of the Buddha who have sought an assailment, he may be referring to an incident that's referred to as a rather strange incident that's mentioned in the Samyutta Nikaya, in the Discourses on Mindfulness of Breathing. And again, whoops, again it's mentioned in the Vinaya under the rule against taking a human life. According to this account, the Buddha taught the monks the, the meditation which is called the meditation on the impure nature of the body, on the 32 or 31 parts of the body, you know, hair, what's in the body, the hairs of the head, nails, teeth, skin, and so forth, which is often recommended as the antidote to sensual desire. Okay, immediately after teaching that, the Buddha goes into retreat, or is it two weeks or three months? Okay, so the Buddha's in retreat, and then the monks are doing this meditation, apparently unguided, and then they become repelled by the body, and then some of them take each other's life. Well, one takes, they can't take each other's life, because we're one <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> Or they take the lives of, of other monks, or they seek somebody, there's somebody called a pseudo-ascetic, who they persuade to take their life, and then at the end of the Buddha's retreat, he comes out and he looks at the Sangha and he sees so many monks are missing. And then he asks Ananda, where have all of those monks gone? Then Ananda um, explains that what's taken place while the Buddha was on retreat. And then the Buddha says, well, in that case, I'll teach you another meditation subject, which is peaceful and excellent and so forth. And then he teaches mindfulness and breathing. I find that whole incident rather strange because one would think, you know, the Buddha as a master and one who knows the minds of others would know the minds of the people that he's teaching, would know that if I'm going to teach them this mindfulness on the parts of the body, then I should be around to guide them if they encounter problems. And not only this in the sutta, the the Buddha's in retreat, but then the question comes to my mind, where is Sariputta? Where's Moggallana? Where's Ananda? Where's um, Mahakachayana, Anuruddha? You know, it seems like just a bunch of novices have been taught this meditation subject, and no senior monks are around. So it's rather strange. 
In any case, that is what happened, that the, the monks, some monks took the life of other monks, and then they had other monks, a lot of monks take their life, and then some went to this outside ascetic and asked him to take their lives, and that led up to the Buddha proclaiming this rule and teaching mindfulness of breathing as a meditation subject. Okay, so then Puna, after paying homage to the Buddha, he gets up and he takes his belongings and he goes off to the to the Sunna Paranta country. And then during the first rains retreat that he spends there, it says that he established 500 male lay followers and 500 women lay followers in the practice. And he himself realized the three, I would call the three vijas, the three clear knowledges or higher knowledges. So at the time he left, certainly he wasn't yet an arahat, but within this period, he realized first the recollection of past, his own past lives. Then he developed the divine eye by which he could see other beings passing away and taking rebirth. And finally, he realized the destruction of the asavas, the attainment of full liberation. And then this sutta just tells us on a later occasion, the Venerable Puna attained final Nibbana. But again, this sutta has a parallel in the Sanyutta Nikaya, which says that during that same rains retreat, the Venerable Puna attained Parinibbana, attained final Nibbana. So sometimes you can see that in the course of oral transmission of a text amongst different reciters, sometimes little differences come in. Okay, then word must have spread from Sunna Paranta country in the West through a chain of transmission come to the Buddha <clears throat> who's in the east, east, eastern part of India. And so a number of monks hear this and they go to the Buddha and they tell him that that monk Puna, to whom you gave an exhortation, has passed away. What is his destination? What is his future course? This was the same question that Sariputta had asked about the monk Chana. And then the Buddha says that the clansman Puna was wise. He practiced in accordance with the Dhamma and did not trouble me. I think a better rendering would be, he did not trouble me about matters pertaining to the Dhamma. Then the Buddha announces that the clansman Puna has attained final Nibbana. Okay, and that concludes the discourse. It seems that these two suttas were placed close by the Chana Sutta and the Puna Sutta. Well, for one thing, they're both included in this particular chapter because the over, overriding theme of the chapter are the six sense bases. But the two suttas have something in common that they both deal with a monk who dies prematurely. In one case, through his own hand, in the case of Puna, here, it, there's nothing said about him dying from unnatural causes, but I think in some other texts, maybe from other, other schools that have the same story, I think it might have been said that Puna had been killed by the people of Sunna Paranta. This I'm not sure about. Okay, any questions now about this sutta? The sutta is self-explanatory.
Okay, if there's no questions now, you could give a little talk to the to these two suttas, and then we'll come back. Let's say twelve thirty, then we could have about half an hour of discussion. Okay, so we end with the sharing of the merits. So we share the merits with the Dhamma protecting Devas, the Nagas or the dragon spirits, the Buddhas, the fear spirits, asking them to protect the Dhamma, to protect the world, to protect ourselves. Akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyam tang anumodipa shirang rakantu sasanam akasa ta chabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyam tang anumodipa shirang rakantu desanam akasa ta chabuma ta Deva Naga Mahidika Punyanta Nanumodipa Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Eta Patacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Deva Nanumodantu Sabe Sampati Siddhya Eta Patacham Hehi Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Bhutanamodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Vatacham Hei Sampadam Punya Sampadam Sabe Satanumodantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Bhavagupadaya Avichiheta To Etantare Satakayupapana Rupiya Rupicha Sanya Sanino Dukha Pumuchantu Pusantu Nibhuting Okay, so we end with three half hours the Buddha. I'm gonna find the Chinese one. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, one, two, three. I'll do one. Okay, if anybody has any questions or comments. <laughs> yes. Well, please take that. What is the tradition of ask um, monks back then asking what kind of attainment another monk has gotten. Why, like, why didn't they just say, where are you at? And you're, you know? Perhaps it would have been considered too direct, too confrontational, too blunt. Or do they do and it for the purpose of the suttas? And to, what? Or do they do it, do they suggest it like that just for the purpose of the suttas? You mean a stylistic feature? Yeah. That's hard to say. One does. I'm just trying to think if there are passages where one monk will directly ask another, "What is your attainment?" Those who attain our hardship, you know, in normal health, come often. They come to the Buddha and they make a declaration, but even then, they don't say, "I've achieved our hardship." But what they usually say is that, "I've understood." Rebirth is finished, the spiritual life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more for this, coming back for this. Even then it's done in a somewhat indirect way. Though the Buddha makes pronouncements
about the attainment of disciples, usually after they pass away. <laughs> Well, but there are a few cases, of, actually a few cases come to mind of this is where disciples do make declarations of their attainment. I'm thinking particularly, there's actually a lay woman who makes a declaration that, again, is a little bit indirect, but they say that how does it go? It is impossible that anybody might say of me that I have not abandoned the five lower fetters. So it's like implicitly suggesting the attainment of the stage of non-returner. Well, there is no fetter bound by which I might come back to this world, something like that. Yeah, did somebody else take the yeah, microphone? I have it here. Okay. Hello? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, there's something very unsettling about the sutta yeah. having a justification for suicide. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to understand maybe how that might be. <laughs> um, I imagine that someone who is close to being an arhat or is an arhat yeah. can attain such levels of absorption in meditation yeah. and abandon pain. Um, why wouldn't that be a recourse as opposed to? Apparently that is not necessarily the case. Or let's say it seems that is not necessarily the case and it's apparent in the case of this monk, that he wasn't able to go into, you know, a deep meditative level where he could uh, be exempt from that pain. Probably the, the pain of that condition would have prevented him from going into that level of absorption. It seems to, to me to be the case. Hmm. Thank you. <clears throat> That kind of makes sense because when someone's in severe pain, you're not really functioning. You can't think straight. You can't do anything. Um, so uh, this is something I know of, very well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I understand that because um, situations yeah. put you in there and you become non-functional. Yeah, I, exactly. Then yeah. I can understand that response. Yeah. I'm not comfortable with this either. Um, <laughs> I don't know how being an arhat justifies that you can do this and kill yourself. Like, could there be some karma? We have a sickness and mm. that we have to go through. Yeah. And like, just to burn up something or other. I don't know, but. I, I don't see how the killing is correct. Okay, the, it could well be the case that the illness that he has and the pain that he's undergoing is the result of karma. And so for this reason, for somebody who is a non-arahat, one would not suggest, but this raises an interesting question, but let me just continue along that track. So it would be advisable not to take one's own life because the karma is still there. So if one cuts off the life faculty, that karma can still get the chance, probably will get the chance to ripen in some other way. But th this monk is, will accept his claim that he's an arhat. So once he cuts off the life faculty, there's going to be no further rebirth any place. And so there's no opportunity for that karma to ripen. And so though there might be karma responsible for the pain, by cutting off the ground on which that karma ripens, there's no chance for it to ripen. I know the sutta is a bit unsettling. 
But I wonder to what extent this comes, I have to say, from our Judeo-Christian background, the idea that God gives us life and that therefore life is something, a, a gift, a sacred gift given to us by God. When, look, when instead one takes in or brings in the background of a beginningless cycle of existences, one succeeding another, um, and each existence is originates through ignorance and craving, and it provides the field for the karma to ripen. Okay, then the alternative to the continuing of existence, it's, you know, we think against the Judeo background, Judeo-Christian background, if one commits suicide, then either there's a either there's a blank of nothingness or there's one is going to be punished by God with eternity in hell. But here the alternative to going on through the rest of his life, it's the Anupadi Sesa Nibbana Datu, the Nibbana without any residue remaining. And so the choice is whether to continue in this extremely oppressive, afflicted, painful condition in which all avenues of healing have been tried and nothing has worked. Thank you. Or going into the Nibbana element and experiencing eternal, everlasting, unshakable bliss. I just wanted to add to that. I once heard a, a, a monk once who was asked, isn't life a gift? Uh, and he said, if this is a gift, please give it back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and in other words, trying to get past this Judeo-Christian idea of we've been gifted this life yeah, and yeah. we have to... But yeah. I also wanted to ask, it seems like a big part of what the, especially the first sutta is teaching is how hard it is to um, assess one's or someone else's attainments in general. Because yeah. they seem like you know they're struggling to figure out what this particular monk's attainments are. And even yeah. they think he has deluded himself as to knowing what he himself has attained. Yeah. And yeah. so is there is there sort of a message here about beware of what you think is the case? Or how do we really know these things? Mm. I didn't see that as the intention. Let's say, before I wasn't thinking of that as the message of the sutta, but now that you bring it up, it does seem to be maybe a secondary message of the sutta. Particularly Sariputta, you know, who is the foremost in wisdom, but it seems that he didn't excel in supernormal cognitions, and so he didn't accurately assess, you know, he, well, he couldn't, he didn't assess, get access to the information on his own, and he thought by questioning to get access to it. But it's a, as I said it earlier, it's a bit strange that he asks the questions that are more appropriate for ascertaining whether or not somebody has reached, you know, even the first stage of realization, the stage of stream entry, rather than asking a question specific to the attainment of our hardship. And then Mahachunda apparently didn't accept Chanda's claim about his, his stage of attainment, because he was giving him advice based on the assumption that he's still dependent, dependent on craving. Pandit, there's a question on the internet. There's uh, the question is, if we consider the commentary interpretation, then it's, it's about, uh, is it possible to reach arahanship in such a short amount of time from the moment the vulnerable cut his flow? So it's hmm. like that, okay. as a matter of seconds. <laughs> Again, this is not 
to be taken as a suggestion that anybody <laughs> here try it. <laughs> but my assumption is that if somebody has built up a very, very strong foundation of the insight, so that just a little sort of goad is needed to bring the realization, I would think that that could happen in the interval immediately preceding death. In fact, there is a type of arhat who's recognized, a type of person who achieves arhatship that has a special name, it's called samasisi, which is literally the same hitter, which means the life comes, the life and the attainment of arhatship come together at the same time. I mean, not exactly so simultaneously by the minute or by the second, but it means that if somebody is just about to pass away, just within like a few moments before passing away, they can reach our hardship. Did I say Richard have a? Did you have your hand up? I take the please take the microphone. That I, I have a I have a friend who was the granddaughter of the uh, monk who founded the abbot who founded the first uh, Buddhist temple in Honolulu, and she grew up with the belief that that uh, suicide was never allowed, not only in Buddhism but in she thought in all wisdom literatures, and she you know spent she talks to me about this and she. She spent a lot of time reading all kinds of stuff, yeah. and she believes that all the religious literature is is against, is set against suicide, and so I, I think it's, it's it's not just a Christian belief. At least it's mm. one that mm. that some you know that some Buddhists are raised with. Mm. Yeah, it's a, that's actually not the case because I know that the Jains. One of the ideals for the Jains. Yes is to yes. end one's life by completely desisting from food. Yes. That's considered like the supreme ascetic ideal for the, yeah. for the Jains. Yeah. Right, it's something like the the 31st stage of purification. Yeah, one of those, yeah. Right, yes, you're right. Mm. But anyway, I'm saying that, that her belief, mm. that was her belief, mm. and mm. she, so it's, I mean, there are, there are non-Christians who mm. grow up with that belief. Mm. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments on this? Can I ask another question about yeah. suicide? Yeah. Uh, is, is there any case that someone is not yet an arhan, it's okay to commit suicide? It is, it's an interesting question. It was one that I thought of when I was answering one of the earlier questions. Because somebody could say, well, if it, even an arhat, who's suffering from an extremely oppressive, you know, intolerably painful illness, can't take it anymore and takes his life, then what about an ordinary person who has an extremely painful, disabling, oppressive, unmitigatingly painful condition? I mean, if the arhat can do it, certainly it would seem that there should be a justification for an ordinary person doing it. But I don't know of any case where that's countenanced in the Buddhist literature. So it seems a little bit hypocritical <laughs> for me to be saying, if I'm speaking to a person who's under a really, a, that we know that the person's not an arhat and he's really suffering from a painful condition, I say, be patient, this is your chance to develop patience, <laughs> equanimity. It's a great opportunity for practice. Just have to have the courage to go through with it. We're always here to help you, to give you any medicines you need. And then he says, well, Chana did it, and he was in our heart. 
And what am I to say? <laughs> if Chana and Arhat couldn't be patient enough, <laughs> equanimous enough to endure it, then what about, you know, Joe, Joe Smith? I don't know, any ideas? Well, Bhante, one thing that comes to mind is that so Chana, being an arhant, knew that he would be safe after death, that there'd be no problem there. Yeah. But it seems to me that anybody who doesn't have that attainment, yeah. um, if they do commit suicide, they might be throwing away this chance to practice Dhamma. They might be reborn yeah. in much less suitable conditions. Um, so I suppose that's, that's a, a possibility. Okay, so he's bringing the case of a stream enter. Rishi was going to say something? Just speak loudly. Right. Well, what, if, what, if, what if, say, there were elements of what a modern writer would consider to be part of that dialogue, which would be the Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, definitely that's the case, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it seems that there's a lot in the background here that is not recorded and we don't have access to. <laughs> yeah, and I had a very good friend in Sri Lanka who was a Buddhist monk from Switzerland. This goes back almost 10 years ago. And also a gifted artist. I say that along with Picasso, he might eventually be regarded as one of the greatest artists of the 20th century. And he had contracted a cancer and he didn't want to go through with it. And so he just stopped eating. This was for a period, it actually started, let's see, about the beginning of November. It lasted until December 21st, almost exactly nine years ago, when he passed away, he stopped eating and drinking, drinking, except he would occasionally take a swig of water just to moisten the mouth. And he always kept in a very, very cheerful, cheerful mood. He would be able to give Dharma talks, sometimes talking for people for hours with enormous strength and energy right up till the last week or so. Um, yeah, I tried to convince him to give it up by, by email and he would answer me in the humorous ways. And so this is just the case that I know 
personally. And then there was, before I went to Sri Lanka, this goes back to the 1960s, there was a British monk by the name of Jnana Veera who had several ill... Ill he believed that in a, an earlier time he had achieved Sotapati stream entry, but then he contracted several illnesses which were very disabling and prevented him from practicing meditation. And he tried living with them for years, but he just felt it was too much to continue. And then he took his own life. I'm not really saying this to try to <laughs> to give a, a rather bleak portrait of, of the Buddhist monastic life. <laughs> if anybody would like to ordain, <laughs> we'll <laughs> we will make the knives and the poison gas available. <laughs> And we have special rooms set up. <laughs> no food delivery. <laughs> but I think maybe the purpose of the sutta is, perhaps this is the underlying purpose, to show that there are physical conditions which are so disabling to the body that in the case of an arhat that it could serve as grounds or reasons for taking the life. Yes, please. Wait, please take the microphone. Could there, could there also be a very, very deep underlying concept here that Buddha was trying to kind of um, rationalize it for the other uh, noble monks, whereas the, the concept is, is what he, how was his practicing throughout his life? I mean... How, how was what? How was, how was his practice throughout his life? He had already yeah. attained such a high level of practice. Yeah. Yeah. And does it really matter at the very last minute of his death, do we need to throw a label onto it? He's become enlightened or he has not become enlightened. I mean, if he was already, if, if he was already practicing compassion and kindness throughout mm -hmm. his life, does it really matter at the end whether or not he had he attained the label of being enlightened? It's just a word to me. So maybe Buddha was like, well, you know, he's, he basically took his own life, yeah. you know, in a blameless way. He, yeah, well, he, in an early part of the sutta, he himself is the one who says, I will use the knife or take the knife blamelessly. Yeah, so I'm thinking... And that's, that statement sort of gets its meaning, is illuminated by what the Buddha says towards the end of the sutta. Yeah. That one who puts, lays down the body without picking up another body is blameless. And so he himself is the one who is... He's not using the label arahat, but by expressing himself in that way, He's um, implying as much. I actually think the the person who's dying is acting ap appropriately hmm. for for what he's trying to achieve in his own life. The no. other the other the other uh, monks are somehow trying to put a label on what's happening to him, whether or not he's going to attain enlightenment or not. And I I just don't understand why they even would even try to attach grasp that. If you're trying, why you're trying to? It's almost like trying to grasp dharma, right? Mm -hmm. And that's something that you really, you really shouldn't practice either. Well, this is Sariputta and Mahachanda, and <laughs> like Sariputta was the foremost. He was like the Buddha's right hand, chief disciple. Mahachanda is another one of the great disciples. So, <laughs> I think that they would have had a reasonable purpose in questioning him. It's not that they were just. Um, you know, ordinary monks who are just anxious to get a label to put on on the monk Channa Channa. Thank you. Maybe Sariputta's intention in the questions. Maybe I don't know. Maybe it was to trip him up and convince him to get him in a position where he couldn't answer correctly, and then he would see that he was not at Arhat 
But in fact, he answered correctly, at least for the level of a noble disciple. Yeah, as Richard said, there seems to be like a lot in the background that is not articulated in the sutta itself. So that is often the case in suttas. Wait, wait, please take the microphone. Did they know did they know he was going to kill himself when they went to visit him initially, or did they go just because he was dying? No, no, I think they just went just to check out his condition to see how he was holding up and to see if he you know if he needed anything. Yeah, there's a story that comes, it comes in the commentaries and not in any canonical text. It actually is set during a lifetime of a previous Buddha, <laughs> which sort of puts it in a safe remove. But a group of monks, they sort of want to expedite their attainment of our hardship, so they climb up to the top of a steep mountain They climb up by, you have to, to get up there, you have to use like a rope ladder. <laughs> and so they use a rope ladder to get up there. And then they discard the ladder so that they have no way to get down, except the only way to get down would be to use the supernormal powers. And so the idea is that <laughs> they make the vow that we're not going to climb down in order to get food. We're going to stay up here meditating until we reach our hardship or some noble attainment together with the supernormal powers and then we'll use our supernormal powers to go down, to go on arms round. <laughs> and then I think of three of them. The first one achieves our hardship and then he uses his supernormal power to go down and he collects enough food for three and then he brings the re remainder up to the other monks, but they say if we were to take it, we would be breaking our vow. You've done your work, we have our work to do, you can leave us. So he goes. Then the second one achieves non-returning together with the supernormal powers, and he does the same thing and comes back to offer the alms, the extra alms to the first monk. Um, <coughs> and the first monk, or the only remaining monk, sends him away and says, you've done your work. I don't want to break the vow by accepting the food you offer to me. Let me continue with my practice. So the second monk goes away and only one monk is left there and he doesn't succeed and he dies there. But then he, because of his diligent practice, then he's reborn in the Brahma world and then he eventually comes back to the human world during the time of Gautama Buddha. And then he becomes, I think he's a, he becomes one of the figures in the Sutta Nipata, either Sabya or Nalaka. Yeah, Richard. No, 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 no. Yeah, because the, at least there's nothing recorded about that in the text. And I think the sky burial was a kind of practice observed in Tibet. I don't think this was done.
Ja. 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 Ja, there's nothing said about that in the Buddhist text. Um. Yeah, this I don't know, but uh, yeah. 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 Yeah, I don't think so, because I don't know any statement in the Buddhist canonical text or even in the commentaries where there was a tradition for exposing the bodies of Buddhist monks who had died to putting them out in the open for the vultures to take them to pieces. The tradition would be to cremate the body. Yeah. Well, it was also done for the Buddhist monks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but still, I, it doesn't seem to me to be in accordance with, I would call it, the spirit of early Buddhism. Yeah, often the bodies of ordinary people, or maybe the criminals, and maybe the outcasts were just discarded in what they call the cream, uh, not the cremation ground, the charnel ground, just exposed. Where again, it is mentioned in the text that vultures would take them and hawks, fal hawks would would devour the body, and the coyotes, what do they have? Jackals would would eat the body. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but that would have been done in the plain, not on Vulture's Peak Mountain, where there were caves and meditating. The Buddha had his own retreat place on Vulture's Peak Mountain, and other monks would go to live, stay in the grottos on that mountain for their meditation. So I don't think it would have been used for the sky burials. Okay, I think it's one o'clock. Suki, you, you had an announcement to make. Yeah, first I have to say that this is the last class for the winter semester. Or actually, we're still in the fall, the fall semester. During the winter, we don't have the Saturday classes. 
So um, this is the last um, lecture uh, here until like uh, April. Yeah. We don't. We won't have a, a lecture. So uh, me and a few of my friends, we um, we just come on Saturdays, uh, same time, and continue listening to Bante's <laughs> lecture. <laughs> Uh, you know, through Ustream, we've been a actually meditating and uh, uh, go back to previous lectures. You mean Bhante doesn't have the supernormal powers? <laughs> yes, he flies <laughs> over to Bergen County. <laughs> uh, Bergen County, and anybody is close by and has time and wanna just don't miss like a three months of like a winter without Bante at <laughs> all. <laughs> then uh, you can join us. It's um, every Saturday morning. We're gonna have just like here. We're gonna have like a an hour or an hour and a half um, meditation, and then ten o'clock we listen to Bante's previous uh, lectures. So if anybody is interested, uh, just let me know. I can um, send you information or I can give you my email address. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I think you can go back to, I think we started the series on the Maji Minikaya back in 2010. So it goes back quite a long way. Okay, so we'll end with the <coughs> three half bows. <laughs>